The unspeakable crime of genocide has terrorized this century, but never in any century have so many men, women, and children been killed so quickly as in Rwanda in Africa. Four years ago, extremists from the country's dominant tribe, the Hutus, systematically set out to exterminate almost a million people who belong to the minority tribe called the Tutsis. So how does a country where almost everyone was either a victim or a perpetrator cope with genocide? These are the remains of the men, women and children who were slaughtered four years ago. Emmanuel Muranjuari and his colleagues are preserving them as evidence of the genocide that destroyed Rwanda. Emmanuel's afraid that some of these mummified bodies may be what's left of his children. Four of them were murdered at this school, along with his wife and another 70,000 people who had come here seeking refuge. How can you work, how can you live with so much death day after day after day? Why do you do this? I am working here to make this place a memorial so no one here or abroad can deny what happened. They can see the evidence here for themselves. Oh, the grimaces on their faces. It looks like they died in violent and painful circumstances. Oh my God, this one still has a rosary around its neck, yeah. He's trying to hide himself, yeah? And the child is trying to shield himself too. How many people were killed altogether here? <laughs> Thousands. There are 72 rooms full of bodies. Does it still shock you when you see these rooms? Yes, I still feel bad. Especially at night when I can't sleep, and I remember when this nightmare turned real, and they started shooting us and throwing grenades at all the people crowded in these rooms. I only survived because they thought I was dead. The truly shocking thing about what you've just seen is that most likely it could have been prevented. Because three months before the genocide began, a senior Rwandan government official had a crisis of conscience, and he told the commander of UN peacekeepers here that a terrible plan was being hatched to exterminate the Tutsis and moderate Hutus. The commander immediately faxed an urgent warning to UN headquarters in New York. The response, do not intervene. And shortly afterwards, nearly a million people would be slaughtered. It was at a time when the United States and other Western nations simply had no appetite to get involved. They pulled out their troops and their own people. And these Rwandans, almost a million in total, were wiped out within three months. It stopped only when a rebel Tutsi army defeated the Hutu extremists. Now, four years later, more than 100,000 are in jail accused of genocide. They are facing their own day of judgment. I'm accused of genocide and I confess that I killed. I poisoned my own children because they were half Tutsi. Those who confess, even to mass murder, can get their sentences reduced. And those who insist they are innocent are still languishing in Rwanda's prisons, awaiting their day in court. To comprehend the magnitude of what faces Rwanda's justice system, you have to come here to a prison where those accused of genocide are locked up. Almost no one here has seen a lawyer, nor do they know the specific charge lodged against them. 135,000 people are in prison now, and at the rate things are going, most of them will die of old age before their case ever gets to court. Inside these jam-packed prisons, it's the prisoners who run the show, wearing their homemade pink uniforms. Alexei Sabana is one of those accused of genocide, but here he's head of security. Alexei, it's so crowded here, we can hardly walk through. Uh, talk is very, very difficult for us. 
It's all one-way traffic around one way, here. One-way traffic. Yeah. Where, where do all these people, where do they sleep at night? Uh, where is it? They're about to sleep there. Right here? Right here. On the floor? On the floor. And do they have blankets? Oh. One blanket. No. It's no, like a rag. Blanket. There's another there. There's another one, yeah. Can I just tell you something? I've only been in here for two hours now. <laughs> I cannot imagine spending two years. Two years, yeah. It's very, two weeks, even. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. Two days. But all of the people in here mm -hmm. have been charged or mm. on suspicion of having committed genocide. Yes, yes, yes. Why, why should we feel sorry for you? Some of us are innocent. Everyone in prison claims to be innocent. Human rights workers say at least one in five people may have been falsely accused. But prosecutors believe the vast majority of the inmates are guilty. Theophile Mbarushimana used to be a school principal. You said that a student pointed the finger at you, an unhappy student. Is it easy for anybody with a grudge to simply accuse somebody of genocide these days? Especially if he's a soldier, or a military person, or a person in the prosecutor's office. And okay. he can just put you hands up and you go. And how long have you been in here? Oh, that's the fourth year. Four years? Without seeing a lawyer? No. Remember, there are 135,000 prisoners, but there are only 40 defense lawyers to handle all their cases. Rwanda's entire legal system was destroyed during the genocide. Judges, prosecutors, investigators, they were all among the dead. The capable and the competent personnel were either killed, others ran away, or others did kill. Charles Kabanda is the chief prosecutor for one entire region in Rwanda. Less than a thousand cases have been completed so far. Mm. At this rate, people say it's going to take 200 years mm. to clear these prisons. Mm. How long do you think it's going to take, honestly? A long time. How long? Close to what you, have, you said a short while ago. 200 years? Yes, it's possible. But nobody would want it that way. Not the 40,000 inmates who are locked up in one-room dungeons called cachos. They're here because the main prisons don't have any more room. Charles, we're standing here in a room that can't be more than, I don't know, 15 by 15. And there must be about 70 people in here. Mm. That's how the situation is. And they're here, what, day and night, day and locked night. in? Yeah. So where do they go to the bathroom? In here? Yeah. Boy, this is bad. It's more than bad. So bad that some prisoners have died just from the overcrowding. And because the inmates' families have to feed them, they too are paying the price for what happened in Rwanda. I'm 10 years old. But I can't go to school because I have to walk all day to bring food to my father. But I don't even remember him anymore. Is this a human rights violation, what Rwanda is doing, how it's treating its prisoners? Um, under normal circumstances, one would say that it's a, it's a human rights violation. But here is a situation where so many people killed so many. There are too many. We are too few. We must take these people before court. This is one of Rwanda's genocide courts. Three judges with only four months of legal training will decide the fate of Joseph Neginware, a county official who's accused of leading these men to kill 20,000 people. Many of them were slaughtered at a church called Chanika. This is all orchestrated. Witnesses are told what to say when they come to court. If you didn't know better, you would think it's all true. During the massacre at Chanika Church, did you see Negi Nware? I saw him. What was he doing? He was giving orders to all these gangs, saying, kill everyone so no one survives. But Beatrice Mukanzanzimana did survive, 
and she tells a story of unimaginable horror. Raza. They grabbed my child and said, no need to shoot this one. So they swung him by his feet and smashed his head against the wall. Paul Hardy is an English lawyer whose job is to defend Neginware. He belongs to a legal aid group called Lawyers Without Borders. He's volunteered to assist Rwanda's overloaded court system. They're in prison. They're awaiting trial. They have a right to representation. Do you think that these trials are witch hunts or are they really the first step towards reconciliation in Rwanda? I think wholeheartedly the latter. There is a great need for reconciliation and there's a great need for retribution. What do you think will be your fate? I will be sentenced to death. Guilty or not, I know I'll be executed. Can there be reconciliation? Can you forgive these people who committed so much murder? Those that committed this terrible crime should be punished. What they did is unforgivable. But in my own heart, I can forgive. But forgiveness and justice will take a long time. It's family visiting day in prison, and here, as in all of Rwanda, it's clear that generations will pay for the sins of their fathers. Because in Rwanda's genocide, almost everyone was either a victim or a perpetrator. When you go to church, when you go back now to the church at Chanika, and you see that there's only one row of Tutsis left, in a church that used to be half full of Tutsis. What do you think then? When I see the happiness of other families in church, it hurts to remember that my family had 24 people. And now I alone have survived. About those thousands upon thousands of prisoners, Christian said, will probably die of old age before they ever get to trial. 10,000 of them will soon be released for lack of evidence. But that does not necessarily mean they're home free. The government is taking steps to protect them from their former neighbors who may be eager for revenge. <laughs>